for those of you joining us for the first time. Hi and welcome. Uh, my name is Anchika Varma and I run a small initiative out of New Delhi called Offset Projects. Um, we started this series of artist talks actually facilitated in some ways by the pandemic and um, called the Guftagu talk series. And the idea behind these is to kind of understand um, artists' motivations and intentions with their work. Uh, and hopefully that will help us in reading images and reading photography with a little bit more awareness about the, what role the photograph plays in the artist's life as well. Uh, I'm very, very excited to have uh, Alana Hunt join us from Australia right now, uh, where it's probably nearing her bedtime or her dinner time. And, uh, you know, she's going to be sharing, uh, well, a very, uh, I can't say exciting, but I think a very, very sensitive uh, work that she's been engaged with now for almost a decade, I'd say. Uh, right, Alana? Yes, and uh, we uh, were going to talk about not just the work and its it, the different journeys it has had, but also the current form of the work, which is a book that's being published by Yarbul Books. Um, Yarbul is an amazing publishing house based out of New Delhi as well that um, has also um, published Witness uh, previously. And, and Cups of Noon Chai, I believe, is their second publication, uh, which also looks at uh, conversations around Kashmir. Um, I have the privilege of having a little dummy of this with me. And Alana will be actually taking us through um, her motivations behind the work and behind the book. Uh, welcome, Alana. It's so nice to have you here. Yeah, thank you so much. It's um. Because it, as you said, because it has been a work that's been unfolding for um, 10 years now, it's always um, means a lot to be able to talk about the things that don't always materialize in the work itself. Um, so right. it's lovely to be here. And, and also just because uh, the urgency that sort of drove the work back in 2010, that feeling is still there today. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to kind of dive right into this conversation, if, if you don't mind, and, and especially since you said the urgency uh, and in many ways the trigger for you um, with regards to Cups of Noon Chai. Um, you know, I just want to revisit that. In, in the summer of 2010, uh, Tufail Matu, who was a 17-year-old student, uh, was hit with tear gas as he was heading back home from his tuition classes. And... Um, Kashmir kind of came together and responded to that act of violence. Um, I believe at that time, Alana, you were in India and in fact, you were studying in India as well. Uh, do you want to just take us through that trigger point and where you were, um, you know, with regards to your motivations within, uh, with photography and, and, and with politics as well, maybe to a certain degree? Um, sure. So, um, I first came to Delhi in 2008, initially on an artist residency with the Sarai program. Um, and I was there for five months. And, um, after that, uh, that led to me enrolling in a master's program at, at JNU. So I was there for almost three years. And during that time, I started to visit Kashmir, um, yeah, and forged relationships with people and the place and stuff. Um, I was travelling back from Kashmir to Delhi by road when Tufail, um was killed. And um, when I reached Delhi, a friend in JNU ran up to me and told me that this boy had died. And... Um, she was really exasperated and I didn't quite understand it because, you know, in the previous month that I'd been in Kashmir and earlier in the year as well, like quite a few people had died um, right. in, like at the hands of security forces and stuff. So kind of her urgency didn't initially make sense to me. Um, but 
with Kashmir's response. It did. And not long after that, I moved back to Australia after an absence of almost three years. So I was suddenly back in Australia. Um, and that was a time when I had first started using social media in 2010. And so from Sydney, I was in touch with a lot of people back in Kashmir. And we were, were literally watching um, uh, the death toll rise day by day in, in Kashmir that summer. Right. And um, yeah, no one around me in Australia kind of had any awareness whatsoever of what was taking place back there. And, you know, friends were living through curfews and um, really not a good situation at all. Uh, so the work kind of emerged as a way to try and fill that, that gap between what was really absent in Australia at the time and what was so, um, uh, you know, present and... Uh, yeah, and what was so, what's the right word, like, what was unfolding in Kashmir was so absent from where I was, yet I was sort of connected to it um, through people and through social media and email and correspondence and stuff. So it, it felt there was an urgency to try and fill that gap. And initially I had thought about writing something, um, like a more conventional kind of essay or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was actually so much writing coming out of Kashmir at that time. It just wasn't kind of getting the, uh, I'm not sure circulation is the right word, but the kind of, um, it, it wasn't resonating with people outside of a certain sphere yeah. who already sort of largely knew about what was happening in Kashmir. So. I began to really, uh, I began, I saw these conversations as a way to sort of, uh, for myself to learn, but to also engage other people in a conversation and connect what was taking place in Kashmir with other places as well. Right. Um, I mean, it's interesting that you said that about Australia because very often, I think uh, people in India don't know what's going on with Kashmir either. You know, um, whether yeah. it's a choice that, that someone's made to kind of block, you know, a particular nature of information for themselves um, or whether it's something that's definitely facilitated by, uh, by a very defined control of what information is actually put out there. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like a void very often. Uh, you only hear about particular headlines that are phrased in a very defined manner, uh, you know, uh, with, with their own kind of motivations behind it. And so in some ways, this uh, almost, I guess this guftagu that you were having, you know, with, with people all around the world at the same time, um, allows for, for a conversation with no... Um, with no def defense mechanisms kind of set up at the same time, because uh, you know, what's really beautiful and I, I've been able to um, read a bit of, of the book as well. Uh, it's this idea of, of memory and, and activating uh, the, the political act of, of remembering someone, uh, you know, um, just to give a little bit of a backdrop, Cups of Noon Chai is um, a series of 118 conversations that Alana has had with people from Australia, India, and, and Kashmir, uh, if, I, if I'm uh, right, right? And um, each, of, each, of these, um, each of these moments of slowness and, and taking in that have happened over a cup of, of Noon Chai with with different individuals has been uh, an act of remembrance for the 118 people who were killed as, as um, through largely security forces uh, in, in Kashmir. Uh, would, I, would I be correct in saying that, Alana? Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and I think 
just that very act, just that act of, of almost like a memorialization through, through a ritualistic sharing of tea, uh, you know, is something that uh, it's, it's really evocative for me even to think about it. You know, um, we do consider the, the sharing of, of ideas and the sharing of who we are over tea as an extremely intimate and personal experience. It's how families get to know each other and it's how we share the everydayness of our being. Um, so it was really beautiful to know that there was such a strong and fierce act in many ways, but shared through, through a method maybe that allowed a certain kind of sensitivity and reflection in the pure ritual of, of you know, of it. Um, do you want to share, I mean, what and how the, 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 the cup of noon chai actually came into being for you in this act of remembrance? Um, I like, I just actually really enjoy nun chai as a drink, right? right? Um, so even before this project began, I was, when I came back to Delhi from Kashmir, I was often making it in my hostel for friends and right. just sort of naturally speaking to people about Kashmir through that. And, and the same thing when I returned back to Australia. Um, so like you said, how, how drinking a cup of tea and conversing over a cup of tea is, is a really kind of central social and communal action. It's like so central to life in Kashmir, like nun chai is. It's, it's consumed all throughout the day in, in every household for all sorts of different circumstances, like celebration and bereavement, breakfast, afternoon, occasionally after dinner. Um, but then for me, like I was actually just making the tea personally and then just quite informally speaking to people about Kashmir. And so this had sort of been going on for a couple of years before the project begun. And then I guess I sort of sought to formalize it as a way to, um, when people were being killed in Kashmir, it was happening on such a day-to-day -day basis that summer. And, um, you know, I was just uh, concerned that it would be swept under the carpet of history, you know? Um, and I, I didn't know personally the people who died that year. Um, but I could make a work that kind of pieced together parts of their world that I knew a little bit about and to connect that um, to other places as well in the process and sort of draw, compile memories and events and sentiments almost as a kind of evidence so that what you're saying so that we do remember so that it's not forgotten so that it isn't it's isn't swept under the carpet so yeah right um i think it would be really nice if if you don't mind if you could um share a reading as as you mentioned you have have done previously as well of, of one of these conversations uh, from the book, I think it'll help uh, those who are listening to the chat also get a sense of, of what this is like. Yeah. Um, so this is one that you chose. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, it's called Colonization That Wears a Mask and it's the 15th cup. So it's relatively early in the, in the series. Is Kashmir like a city in India or more like a state? Asked Jordan, a 16 year old who grew up surfing on the north coast of New South Wales in Australia. Kashmir is a contested, unresolved region with three countries, India, Pakistan and China, all trying to stake a claim and marginalizing the aspirations of Kashmiris themselves in the process. There was a globe in the room and Jordan and I looked over it to see how Kashmir had been depicted. Manufactured in Denmark in 1997, an especially violent period in Kashmir, the globe illustrated Kashmir as a place with a name but without borders. The dotted lines that surrounded other countries were absent and Kashmir emerged as an open area 
sitting between India and Pakistan and China. After Jordan learnt of the death of 17-year-old Tufail Matu, he paused for a moment with the nunchai resting at his mouth. Tufail was only one year older than Jordan. He asked, if the UN is so good, why don't they step in and do something to help Kashmir? Kashmiris themselves have asked this question repeatedly, and Kashmir remains one of the oldest disputes on the Security Council's agenda. But much to the dismay of many Kashmiris, India continues to insist it is an internal matter that needs to be resolved between India and Pakistan. Recently in Kashmir, a rumor spread that the UN had removed Kashmir from its list of unresolved conflicts. People were up in arms, but it was soon dismissed as false. Just a week earlier, Aung San Suu Kyi had been released from house arrest in Myanmar. Her story flooded the news headlines that Jordan read. Kashmir needs to be in the media. It needs the kind of attention Burma has. Is it the same kind of situation? A military junta that prohibits democracy runs Myanmar. Kashmir is a military occupation with different countries, where different countries are claiming the place as their own. Jordan connected the situation in Kashmir to the colonization of Hawaii, Australia and New Zealand. But while these were European forms of colonization that took root in centuries past, today things were slightly different. Now it is kind of like an intelligent colonialism, he went on to explain with the 16 year old's beautiful clarity. This feels like a kind of colonization that wears a mask. When I thought back to the globe Jordan and I had begun with, I wondered whether it would be better to see Kashmir surrounded by dotted lines like the other countries, or to see the whole world like Kashmir as a place without dotted lines. That's the end. Yeah. Thank you. Um... I'd also like to specify that there is a postscript uh, to this particular uh, cup of noon chai, uh, which does address um, Aung San Suu Kyi's uh, denial of the genocide of Rohingya Muslims uh, after her release from prison. Um, thank you for sharing that, Alana. Thank you so much. Yeah, and, um, yeah there's a few postscripts that emerge in the book because... Um, the conversations were had between 2010 and 12, mm -hmm. um, and particularly as we've gone through and edited them, there have been things like that that have right. needed addressing. So there's a couple of postscripts that emerge. Right. Uh, in fact, uh, in many ways, the book pretty much uh, compiles not just postscripts of, of news-based developments, but also um, material that's kind of accumulated as, as a result of this work existing over 10 years, right? I mean, we have newspaper clippings from um, the reader as well that's, uh, that's in this. The serialization has, has had a particular formation. Um, it would be nice if you can share some elements of, um, of how and why this book came into being uh, and why it came to being today, uh, more specifically as well, if, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, as you said, like the work has begun with me um, sharing cups of nunchai with 118 people. And I wrote from memory about those conversations. And I took a photograph of each person holding um, the cup of nunchai after they'd drunk it. Um, so you can see this, a grid oh, yes. in here. There's um, the single versions like, here yeah, and, and the whole the of them from Alana's screen, yeah. yes. So th that was also, um, you know, as we're talking about photography and images, like me wanting to uh, photograph those hands was also sort of a gesture of care and solidarity that I was conscious of kind of accumulating over time. And it was, the whole work itself has been a bit of a, um, a roundabout way of, of representing Kashmir as well, because um, I didn't, I never really felt comfortable um, going in there and photographing um, people and places myself. So it's sort of a um, roundabout way of, of doing that. 
and and I think it um, evades some of this sort of uh, or sidesteps some of the dominant ways within which Kashmir is represented, which is often either kind of um, a heavenly sort of fertile landscape or a um, deeply militarised violent zone. Mm -hmm. So I was sort of developing a different kind of visual language to hold the work. Uh, so as I was having the conversations and writing about them, uh, and taking those photographs, it was accumulating onto a website as that was happening. Okay. Um, it, it took me two years to have the 118 cups of Nun Chai. Um, and then I knew I wanted to sort of circulate it further. Um, and, you know, the work has been in exhibitions and it's been in, um, uh, you know, literary festival contexts and art festival contexts as well but they've sort of been um a minor part of the work and one avenue that it can circulate through but definitely not um the dominant or core or most meaningful avenue that i've wanted the work to circulate through so um as i mentioned before to you when we were chatting off the video like um the work and um, I guess you could say like my practice as a whole that has engaged with Kashmir has balanced between um, sharing my work within Kashmir and then also wanting to share it outside of Kashmir um, and so after I finished actually having the cups of Munchai and uh, writing about them they needed a big edit um, and I spent a couple of years editing them and feeling a bit doubtful about the work as a whole and just working through it and I knew I wanted to publish it in book form um, or but the reason I was interested in book form is because I saw it as a means of circulation um, okay. the book form didn't like arise there wasn't a publisher interested in it or anything at that time um and i'd always been really interested in newspapers i like them because they're um part of the public sphere they move in all sorts of areas of daily life um and they kind of reach like a mass audience which is quite um you know interesting to me as an artist so I saw the newspaper as a really wonderful avenue to um, circulate the work back into Kashmir as a serialization. Um, and, you know, as a means of exhibition, like it was a means of exhibiting the work within Kashmir um, over a long period of time and to a, to a much larger audience than a conventional exhibition would allow. A much larger and diverse. Um, Right. So in 2016, um, we began the serialization of the project in Kashmir Reader, um, which began on the anniversary of Tufail's passing. Um, uh, do you want me to go talk about this? Um, yeah, I actually did want to, I mean, there were a couple of things that I did have in mind. Um, one of them was, of course, um, this idea that they had to be a book. You had by now also made paper text messages, which is a, you know, a book of a different form uh, and, and with different, well, maybe similar motivations, but different language uh, you know, that involved mm. uh, the voice of people who were actually sending out their own paper text messages facilitated by uh, you know, the sheet that was uh, designed, I think, and, and curated by you to a certain degree. And uh, I was curious to know in terms of when you started writing uh, and when you started editing these 118 conversations, um, what kind of factors were very important for you? What were the concerns that you were looking at when you were bringing the edit down to um, the 118 or, or was there an editing down at all or not? And, and secondly also, um, I wanted to uh, I wanted you actually to speak a little bit about this idea of, of writing from memory as well. Uh, 
you know, if you could kind of address that a little bit. Um, maybe, maybe we can start with this and then I'll, I'll have a few more questions for you sure. before we move further. Um, I chose to write from memory because I didn't want the conversations to feel like an interview um, or something that was being recorded. So I wanted them to have that sense of intimacy and um, people could speak openly and not feel intimidated by the process or anything like that. Um, but that notion of memory also overlaps with the idea of memorialization, which is at the heart of the work. Mm -hmm. So um, that was there. There's also a sense of repetition that the work has, you know, um, repetitive to have 118 cups of Don Chai. Um, and, you know, the, the killing of civilians in, in Kashmir, the killing of people in Kashmir is repetitive. Um, and, but that was something that became a little bit, um, I was conscious of trying to avoid the repetition of the same story too many times within each conversation. So as I went back to edit each conversation, I tried to bring out the uniqueness of each conversation. So we, we might, the texts kind of embody a couple of key points that came out in the conversation. They're not a document of the conversation in its entirety because right. sometimes they spread out over a couple of hours. Right, um, right. I mean, it's yeah. interesting because for me, um, the, the entire book uh, is an act of listening. You know, it's an act of me actually sitting down and, and just understanding from, from very different uh, perspectives very often um, and sometimes not so different um, what, what kind of motivations and thoughts occur to us when we think about massacres like this. Um, like you said, this is part of a, a, a very real world for the people living in Kashmir. It's something that almost has become like a monotonous uh, piece of information that they do come across on every given day because the nature of violence is extreme uh, as well from armed forces. And um, I can understand that in, in, in some of these cases, uh, I mean, I think what I'm trying to get at is, is how do you, how does one actually get themselves to, to speak about something like this um, to an audience that is completely um, unaware of the politics of that land as well. Uh, a lot of the people who you did speak to, um, especially those in Australia, might have very little information about what's happening in, in political scenarios. And, and maybe a means of understanding that is actually to draw parallels from other, other countries where uh, similar acts of violence also take place. And, and it's interesting to, to think of these parallels as almost like as an invisible solidarity building between these countries as well, I feel. I mean, uh, you know, but were there any, I mean, were there specific concerns or questions that, that you were very conscious about as someone who, you know, had, had engaged with Kashmir for, for a, a limited time frame as well at, you know, uh, I, I believe you mentioned that uh, the, your last visit was in um, 2013, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, 2012 is the last time I've actually been there. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm curious to know if, uh, because you've obviously been in communication and in touch with those people, um, of course, over the last year, uh, that communication, I'm sure, has been very difficult as well, because there's been a complete communication blockade uh, for a fair amount of time, even in Kashmir. Um, how do you negotiate the conversations that do come into the book, the elements that do come into the book, um, you know, uh, while assimilating things like the readings that you've had, the exhibitions that have taken place before, um, how does that kind of come together maybe in, in a book? And, and, and in the same way, what kind of concerns impacted the materiality of the book as well? Um, okay, so I'll try and answer, try and answer two things come to mind. Um, 
One, like I'm just thinking now about the piece you asked me to read with Jordan, the 16 year old in Australia, um, who, yeah, more or less had no kind of understanding of, of Kashmir prior to our conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so I think some of the questions he asked, um, I think they're resonant. Um, they reveal things about, about his thinking about how Kashmir is perceived is the, in the world, how it could be perceived. Um, and I think, you know, his, that particular piece too just um, struck me a bit then because the way that he refers to Australia, Hawaii and, um, and New Zealand, like forms of settler colonialism that um, are unfolding in Kashmir right now in a way that they weren't in 2010 and 11, when the conversations in this book were taking place. Um, so you mentioned briefly about um, earlier, just about how it is sort of producing this now. Um, and one thing, there's sort of been three key moments in the work, like over the last 10 years, like one is its point of origin in 2010 when it came into being. Mm -hmm. The other was the serialization in the newspaper that took place from mid 2016 into 2017. Right. So that was when um, Burhan Wani was killed and um, you know that set up That's off a whole killer. other period yeah. within Kashmir that that even beyond my work connected 2016 to 2010 in people's memories you know completely right. independent of of my work which was literally placing 2010 into the newspapers of the day at that time right. and so now we're circulating where you know we've been producing and making and soon publishing the book in book form in 2020 mm -hmm. um when there's a whole lot of things going on but I see these things as sort of interventions into these moments and I hope in a way that the work can um can also be a point of connecting the present with the past a bit and okay. kind of showing the uh continuity and the almost the um the hints of what was coming what is coming and that we can learn from in terms of thinking materially about the book, like I didn't want to make something that was a um, a coffee table photo book. I wanted it to be something that was um, every day that could be, um, you know, or almost like the size of a normal normal novel, you know. Right. So right. the way that the work was was almost like hidden in the folds of a newspaper when it was serialized and it was exhibited we can think of it as being exhibited in the newspaper there. Like here, it's almost like hidden in the folds of a normal-ish sort of looking book that people can just like chuck in their backpack and um, or, you know, take on a bus or read in their bed at home, something like that. Like that everyday form of circulation was really important to me. Um, and then... Uh, also bringing in the newspapers. So yes, was, when the work was serialized in Kashmir Reader, yeah, um, I was really interested in, in what kind of the act of placing these stories and these texts from 2010 to 12 in to the newspapers, which carried the news of, of the present moment within Kashmir. So what would that sort of juxtaposition in a newspaper do when you were carrying the past sort of into the present like daily news um, and and the sort of links that you could build between that so we've carried that into the book as well yeah. and also those newspaper fragments document that period in Kashmir between 2016 and 17 also. Yeah. And you also have um, two texts by Parvez Bukhari and Uzma Falak that are incorporated into the book. Um, yeah. These, these are texts written specifically for, uh, for the book as well, as, as far as I know. Is that? Uh, could you talk yeah. about 
uh, how you know and why you felt these were important uh, for for cups of green chai yeah so um parvez was one of the editors of kashmir reader which serialized the work when it was um published there and um in 2016 that newspaper was banned from october the 2nd for three months right. um so I wanted to find a way to sort of mark that um, ban mm -hmm. within the book. Um, so Parvez's essay um, sits at the point in the book where the newspaper ban took place. Um, and following his essay is the... Um, um, is a text from the cover of Kashmir Reader when it went back, when it resumed printing three months later. Ah, right. Yeah. Yes. Yep. So those are um, you can't read the piece yet, yeah. but the book will be out soon and then you might be able yeah. to. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and you know, it was also a way of um Pavez and Uzma's pieces were ways of connecting with the present in Kashmir as well. Um, so within 2020, and Parvez reflects upon that. And Uzma's piece itself is um, much more of a personal account of um, her experiences post-August 5th in, in Kashmir. Right. And it's almost like um, I, Uzma's piece comes at the very end of the book, and I see it as like a stepping stone from the book into the world we're in now. Mm -hmm. Um, we also have the central fold. Sorry, I am not handling the book very delicately right now. But um, yeah. the central fold also has, um, it has a gatefold, sorry. Uh, there's a gatefold at almost pretty much the center of the book, um, which is maybe like a smaller segment within it saying between atrocity and denial, which actually lists out yeah, which actually lists out um, the 118 names um, whose memorialize whose memorialization is has happened, uh, you know, in the pages of the book as well. Um, it's 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 actually really nice to see uh, that that is part of the book. Very often, I feel. Uh, the, the triggers and the instigators and the, and the core ideas often get lost within the designing of, of a book very often. And, and that's something that I did want to say that um, it's been designed very simply, in a, you know, and, and that's often um, very tough because you also are dealing with very, very different elements uh, in the book. You know, there's, there's the photographs, there's the conversations, there's the news clippings, there's essays there's uh there's a lot of different material but it ends up flowing very organically from one place to the other you know um and uh, i am i'm as a slight deviation I'm, I'm very curious to know how how you were able to allow that flow to happen which often jars uh you know in the reading of, of work especially in a book form sometimes uh um. I think, you know, we worked with Itu Chowdhury Design um, on designing the book and we've been, you know, more or less designing it all year. So it's had time to ferment, to yeah. ferment. Um, I, I really have had like a, a really pared back minimalist sort of um, mood going. Um, yeah. And um, ICD like brought in a bit more of a, a stronger visual language and we just we melded that together um i mean speaking of yeah. fermentation <laughs> you know it's something that we had we discussed briefly uh and i'm i'm curious to know if, if this book had been made uh you know in 2012 I'm, I'm fairly certain it would it would be a very different kind of a book maybe and and it's something that i wanted to talk to you about as part of your own process where uh, you mentioned allowing time to also um, have its own play with your work and, and kind of giving in to time and giving in to thoughts slowly seeping in. Um, mm. You know, how, I, I was just curious to know for your process and for your work, um, 
how does time really play within it? Because each of your works has had um, fermentation time, you know, in, in many ways. Yeah. I, th I think fermentation is really, really important. And I didn't, um, I didn't always um, know that or believe it. Um, when I made paper text messages from Kashmir, mm -hmm. so I initially made the actual paper text messages in 2009 and then um, it wasn't until 2011 that I managed to make the book and a video, an accompanying video to match it. And I really sort of beat myself up over why it was taking me so long to sort of get my act together and, and get it all together and out there. But the timing of that in the end worked very well. Um, and it's similar with Cups of Nun Chai. Um, there have been times where I've sort of uh, felt down on myself for not getting it out in the way that I needed or wanted to sooner. But like um, I'd had this idea of serialising it in the newspaper for a few years before it eventually happened in 2016. Mm -hmm. um, and we never could have, you know, foreseen what, what took place in 2016 uh, and similarly with the book I'd sort of mentioned it to a few people including Sanjay at different points in time um, but like Yarbal books didn't exist earlier yes. either um, Sadly, so then it would have yeah. been good to have more books by then by now <laughs> but I'm very excited um, about that yeah well um yeah and now Yarabal does exist and, and it has come together like that. So, Right. Yeah. And I believe you met Sanjay. And, and I really like this. I can't think of a better publisher to a more, right. um, you know, wise and imaginative, um, you know, and supportive and open publisher to be working with on this project. And I think that's, that's so important because, I mean, I, I believe you, you met Sanjay, uh, very early on in your, uh, you know, during your time in India. And, and there was, in some ways, a conversation, at least, that had started off, not necessarily about the work or the book, but just maybe just getting to know someone and, and uh, you know, knowing that you can trust the intentions and ideologies of, of who you are collaborating with. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, we, you know, we actually haven't, spent much time at all together in person. Um, but I did meet him when I was in Delhi and, um, you know, we'd cor we've corresponded on and off over the years. Um, so yeah, it, that is again, something that's grown very um, naturally. And, yeah. Um, I also wanted to kind of talk to you about the act of, of the archive, like the, the place of the archive, because in many ways, although these are conversations written, um, from memory and and as a as a as an act of memorialization there's they still become a very important archive of of very factual material as well um you know um and so and similar to i mean this is very in in that respect it's very similar to uh, even your other works or or your process um you know within within your own personal work. I mean, I just want to kind of step back from the entire bit and kind of look at that. And, uh, and I just wanted to know for, for you, what, what does the role of the archive mean? Uh, I mean, in some ways, this is, this is also challenging an archive, I feel, to a certain degree, because we are archiving something that, that didn't make it into an official canonized institutional archive, right? Um, is that something that you've, you've thought about very consciously as, you know, as part of your own process as an artist, or is it something that's kind of emerged? Um, like, do you mean the conversations or the history or like, which I mean, part as, of as it a didn't... practice uh, in your artwork, not just with Noon Chai, but, uh, you know, even if one is to look at paper text messages or your other works in, in some forms, they, they do, uh, whether it's intentional or not, they create almost, like for me, they, it's, it's like the building of different archives uh, as well. And, and considering that seems you know, to be. I actually feel angry. Um, 
and and that's where the impetus to archive things comes from um right because it you know what's happening makes you feel angry and it is um a lot of it is not i i don't mean my work in this sense i mean um you know in relation to kashmir what's happening there is not um making it into sort of a institutional archive very easily um yeah so i've i wanted to do that to sort of hold these things that are happening accountable i guess in a similar way that um that other people and places are writing reports um you know like uh but this is a slightly more um imaginative or experimental way of of doing that it's not a report as such um much yeah but there's definitely a sense of anger and urgency that makes one want to sort of archive and hold these things in the face of something that's trying to push it away yeah. or obfuscate it you know bury yeah. it uh hide it obscure it though those things are what you're trying to work against right right um i'm gonna quickly come back to uh the book and because i can see there are a couple of questions that are here so i'd, I'd like to address them as well but just working on on the form of the book and uh, you know at some point you had mentioned uh, in our in our previous talk about about how you were thinking about the artwork being present in the form of a book um and and then the book also not being something that's that's usually like an artist book or a photo book but something that's a more conventional format uh that allows an everydayness uh, an everydayness to you know to it it doesn't kind of make you feel that this is something precious but it's something that you can really engage mm. with uh you know in some ways I, i do have to say and i was mentioning this to sanjay as well that uh, because i've got a, a lived in version of of the dummy from the printers it actually did feel a lot more comfortable to read the book um uh you know and what i was doing was was literally kind of choosing pages at at random in in some ways uh, although there is a serialization i i uh, i i don't think it's it, there is a particular linearity to it uh please please correct me if i'm wrong on that well um, they're there in a chronological order right but um you don't have to read it in a linear way right and i mean that was one of the things that was really kind of nice about it is that at any page that i could uh chance upon on a given day uh there yes. is a there's a different conversation that might echo very similar concerns so so that repetition that you know you were talking about in my head is almost like a repetition of questions that keep emerging in my mind as i keep reading um your uh, your chai session you know with with different people and um in many ways it was interesting because at one point of time you know um i would try and see if i can remove uh, the age or the geography of the person who you speaking with uh, and if i kind of remove that from my reading of of that conversation would the same question still emerge you know um it was just i think it was just something that i was trying to play with on my own and i think that really echoed with me the fact that every single page is a different conversation in itself but at the same time it connects uh you know to the larger larger concerns of the, of the book let's just say and um so i was i was because of that i think i was curious to know why the serialization why you felt the serialization uh needed to be there um one is of course i i realize it's it's the uh, it's the date and the chronology of of events as well um but um i i was curious to know what what it would be to to not have this serialization like and i was curious to know why you felt the serialization was needed do you mean to not have it appear in the newspaper progressively over time or um 
No, I mean in the book or for it to become like the 25th cup or, you know, the 86th cup uh, in uh, that sense with, with the date. Um, so are you trying to imagine it without reading the dates or the numbers? With the dates, without the dates. Yeah, okay. Um, I've never thought about that before. Okay. Um, it was just a curiosity I did. I had, uh, you know, in my, I mean, the, the numbers I do understand because, you know, uh, they're, they're very critical to the structure of the book as well. Um, I was, because I was, and I guess because I was not going in order of the book, I, and I was just kind of, you know, picking up different pages yeah. in the book, I think. But the, the dates are the dates that I had that conversation with that person. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so it, I guess it, it just, for me, instinctually, it just felt right to mark that and also to contextualize that when that conversation took place in relation to oh. other things and other events and other histories that have taken place. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah that's, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I'm just going to move to, we have, we have a question here by an anonymous attendee who actually um, wanted to know um, she or he or they uh, have written could you talk a bit about your process and how did you approach and make a connection with the uh, kashmiri families especially with um, the language barrier yeah um so all of the peoples who um i whose families i have stayed with in kashmir uh, spoke English at, to some degree. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I've actually always um, spoken to people about um, trying to translate cups of nunchai into Urdu or Kashmiri. Um, but like a lot of people in Kashmir have said, it's, it's not necessary. Like actually the English um, language media, like the press within Kashmir is quite dominant. Like, um, in itself. So, yeah, language was not a huge issue in that sense. I, I could, you know, have basic kind of Hindi conversations um, and that, you know, carries into Urdu in, in Kashmir. And then uh, having people with me to sort of help translate or you know, occasionally I was with people who maybe spoke English as well as my Hindi. So, you know, our conversations could sort of be In jolted there. Um, <laughs> kind of yeah. but, but that's also, that can also be a really nice way to communicate. Um, okay. And there are different things that you arrive, that arise through those forms of communication as well. But I spent most of my time outside of Srinagar. So in, in Kupwara and Sopor and um, near Baramula. Okay. So, um, and I've also spent time in Srinagar after, but when I first went to Kashmir, it was those places I ended up in. So, so you did yeah. mention that a lot of, um, a lot of your engagements with Kashmir uh, were through families and actually through staying and living with with particular families uh, over a period of time. Um, were these relationships and friendships that were, uh, you know, created out of other friends or like out of people you knew in Delhi uh, when you were here that just um, kind of kept expanding? I, I first went to Kashmir um, as an intern with an NGO, actually. Um, for for six weeks, and so they placed us with um, Kashmiri families, mm -hmm. and then I returned to visit those people afterwards. Yeah. Um, and then through that, I made more friends um, with Kashmiris who were in Delhi. And then um, over the years, as as my work kind of unfolded, other other friendships emerged and stuff through that. So. 
Yeah. I, I was also curious to know, uh, you know, with paper text messages and with um, the earlier renditions of Cups of Noon Chai, um, is this work that, uh, that people in Kashmir did end up seeing at any point? Although I realized that a lot of it was made after you um, left Kashmir and, and you were back home in, uh, in Australia. Um, I was just curious if, if the people there have had um, a chance to, I mean, well, now they definitely would be able to, but have they been able to see um, your other works so uh, in, in Kashmir uh, previously? You, are you talking about have they been able to see paper text messages or have they been yeah. able to see my other practice in the kind paper of work I make in Australia? And well? the, uh, paper text messages and the other work. I mean, in some ways, Cups of Noon Chai was, was accessible to them, you know, because of the Kashmir reader itself. So in, in many ways, I think you had, yeah. you had its public. Yeah, so, so like I've never had a, um, a formal exhibition within Kashmir and it's the kind of, um, you know, uh, political, I mean, uh, cultural space where that kind of uh, cultural activity is not um, feasible, at least not very often. Um, so my work has never been exhibited in a conventional way there, but definitely when we made paper text messages, so there were a thousand paper text messages that I literally just printed on small pieces of card and we, we circulated them out into Kashmir. Okay. And 150 of those came back to me in my letterbox, um, were posted and, and some people delivered them by hand as well. Um, so the whole impetus of turning that into a book was a way of exhibiting or of circulating it back into Kashmir. Um, and when we first made the book, we didn't have any money for it. So we literally just made a PDF um, and made that freely downloadable um, online. Um, and so, you know, most of the people who downloaded that were people in Kashmir, not, um, you know, but also some people from elsewhere. Uh, yeah, so I have used the internet um, to try and do that to uh, share work within Kashmir and also the newspapers and, and now the book. So these are three sort of mediums that I've used to, to circulate the work, both within and outside of Kashmir, but particularly within. Right. right. Yeah. I, think, uh, I think that is the time that we do have uh, for, for today. Okay. But um, 10 years and more than 118 conversations later, uh, yeah. Congratulations on, on the publishing of this book. Uh, as we speak, the book is currently, I, I believe, with the printer. It's, it's going through its last few rounds of, of checks and, and it should be released, um, I've been told, around the 20th of November. Uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed. There are no COVID scares or unexpected scenarios that emerge. We've had quite a bit for, uh, for this year, I think. Uh, but we really look forward to the release of Cups of Noon Chai. Uh, the book is being published by Yarbal Books um, based out of Delhi, and it should be accessible in a few select bookshops um, and hopefully also at the Offset Bookshop. I'm hoping and I'm pretty certain that that might happen. Um, until then, actually, uh, Alana and Yarbul have, have Sanjay uh, from Yarbul have gotten together and they've actually made a website um, which has some of the text. It has Alana's text as well uh, and a little brief idea about, about the book. Uh, for those of you who are interested, you can visit um, www.cupsofnoonchai.com and I think more updates about the book will be uploaded there as well. Uh, right, Alana? Yeah, yeah, they will. Okay, <laughs> okay. I just and, wanted to say um, the book will be available on the website also. Oh, wonderful. Um, I'm just going to yeah, from... write in. For those of you interested, I'm just writing in the website uh, on this chat and you can save it uh, you know, for later reference. Uh, before we leave, uh, Santosh uh, Sadanandan actually uh, has not a question but a comment. Uh, there's a constant movement of documents into monuments in your work and process multiple forms of memorials emerging over time. 
producing not only remnants of archives, but also new speakabilities. Wonderful. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, actually there's, uh, there's a, a quote actually um, that's on the book that I'll just um, you wanna read. read. It's read by a, it's by an author from um from Australia. Okay. Um, and he just he says about the work. Um, his name's Ross Gibson. He says now more than ever before the fate of the world must be brokered in the contest between self-assertion and communal allegiance. Here is a work, heartfelt, heartstrung, and heartening, that shows how you might turn the contest into a conversation, leading to a convocation. It starts by pausing, reflecting, brewing, sharing, and replenishing. But I guess like to sort of pick up on what Santosh said, what I like about what Ross says is, um, you know, how we move from kind of a individual conversation into a much larger kind of cacophony. Um, and yeah, for me, there's a whole lot also behind how the work has moved from kind of deeply personal spaces into very public realms and back into personal spaces again, and it kind of moves across those areas. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. And uh, I, hope, I hope to see you sometime soon. And if not, I will know you through your chats, through your cups yeah. and noon chai. Thanks so yeah. much, Alana, and thank you, everybody, okay. for joining in. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Uh, hope you all have a great weekend, and we'll see you next Friday. Bye-bye.